Hello and welcome to another session of Canvas Live. Canvas Live sessions are presented by Canvas community members and or instructor employees to help Canvas users improve and enhance their teaching and learning with Canvas. We are excited to be presenting some of the extended agenda from the CanvasCon Indiana sessions this week. And with us today, we have our friends from Indiana University East, UK Law, and Nina Wilson. And we're excited to hear what they have to say about Canvas. Without further ado, welcome to the session. So, thank you. So, I'm UK and I teach chemistry. Um, and, and I'm Nina Wilson and I work with the Math and Science Research Center in Mathematics. Okay, so what we're going to look at today is how do we structure scaffold student engagement and get students to engage not just with each other, but more importantly, with the learning outcomes and the content that we want with a particular focus on introductory mathematics and chemistry courses. And the challenge really boils down to several things. Well, firstly, we have a lot of content as seen. This is the textbook I use for, um, and it's a very co fairly common textbook that we use in um, majors, general chemistry. There's two semesters work, but I think over a thousand pages and it's not getting thinner. Um, obviously, we have to somehow relate it to lab quite often, although quite often we sidestep that online, particularly if there's um, not so much more like accreditation or other reasons we can't do it. The other thing is, while we have a lot of conce concepts, okay, a lot of things that are visual in nature or reason qualitatively, another heavy part of any physics and chemistry course, it's not just that, and obviously mathematics courses, it's also, you have a lot of calculations. You somehow have to be able to relate, not only do the calculations, but solve the problems and figure out how it relates then to your conceptual framework, okay? So there's a lot of things going on in a STEM course online. STEM courses are not known to be easy on any college campus. Making it online, seem to make it a bit harder sometimes. And we've, what we're going to talk about is how do we try and bridge that gap with a big focus basically on the lecture part of it right now. And, but to begin, I'm going to give a bit of context to our campus. We are a regional campus of the IU system, which means that we are a commuter campus, so we do not have residences. And our students quite often drive, say, an hour to get here. And of our students, we have a lot actually well, beyond that, I think we have approximately 50% of the students online at this point, and um, particularly transfer students. And many of our face-to-face -face students also take online courses depending on scheduling issues or other, or simply because of options that are available or whatnot, or because they have to work. So in STEM, we, in the School of National Science and Mathematics, we have our online degree completion degree, online degree completion degree, i.e. for transfer students for mathematics. And we have face-to-face -face degrees in bachelor's science in biochemistry, biology, and human life science. But even in those degrees, a lot of students take a significant amount of coursework online. We also offer general education courses for non-science majors. A lot of these students are online. They're not near campus. So one of the things that we used to do, we used to use Sakai, which is called on course in the IU context. And in 2015, after a fairly significant piloting process, it was rolled out. And we were given, luckily given a two year um, breeder, two year um, transition period. And I, start, I started um, a bit earlier. And what I did, and I'll give you a bit of an outline, is I started by taking it into a small face to face class first, where I knew all the students. And so one of the things is I was just, and this is just for the purpose of testing, because if I tested it with a small class that I know well, I know that if I had a problem, I can bridge it fairly quickly. But then it works so well that even in the second seven, uh, second seven week online course, I actually taught this course and developed it on Canvas. And I, both of us, ended up using, both Nina and myself, ended up using Canvas for our classes mostly beginning spring 2015, and we've not looked back since. I will say that. 
So, challenges of teaching online. So this is my online course. This is a lecture theater. And, okay, so I've, even though I've picked it, this is not my class. My class is not that big. <laughs> but even there, with a big class, you, and even with somebody on stage, you still have a lot that you miss as an instructor or as a student. And first, the first thing is this, online, there is no, uh, you, you can't check if someone's there. Face to face, you know if they're there. And there's a lot of non-verbal or verbal cues that give you feedback. Are the students looking at you like a blank face? Like right now, I don't, I can't see your faces. If you are absolutely not understanding what we, I'm saying, Good luck. Nope. Or, or non-verbal, uh, no verbal cue, no non-verbal cue. And all interactions end up being formal or on task. So you have to, even if you listen, there's a feedback, and a lot of that feedback has to be formal, unfortunately. The other thing is, and we'll talk about that a bit later, is if you, you, get, you can't grade every single thing a student does, that's supposed to do. You can't grade if they've read the book. And it's asynchronous. So you can't quite often, and one of our emphases is that we don't want, the online courses are designed to be flexible for different schedules. So we can't go around and say, oh, you must show up online at this time every week and attend a class. This is not what we've designed the course to do. So one, people may be at different paces at different times. Although it's not, a, it's not like one of the old, Mail or mail in classes, correspondence courses where they could be at any time, but still, and there's no accountability. And also, it's much easier to lose students. Okay, face to face, you, you're supposed to attend class at this time. The least, even with the most um, unsuccessful classes, I at least know that they will show up. Okay, and if they don't show up, you might see them, you know, other places on campus. And that's not the online environment. So trying to reach out to those students can be a little trickier yep. um, to, to draw them in. It's very easy to lose them. And once you lose them, they'll either be a W or they'll just fail. So, and what we wanted to avoid is, if you think about a student trying to do the minimum. So how can we avoid losing them? Or, even just as bad, okay, so, this is the syllabus. I put it down deliberately from the top of the syllabus kind of. And this is my course. How do I avoid a student seeing the course as this? A list of assignments and deadlines. Game rules. Collect 90% of the points. Get your A. But not really engage in any of the learning. Just try and jump through hurdles. That is not real engagement. So, to do that, you have to think about what the role of a course designer and an instructor is. And at the end of the day, particularly online, face to face, this is true as well. But online, this is even more true, because you are not the, you are clearly can't be there to just spoon feed them at this time at this day. Your coach, you really are there to help students with difficulties define the learning outcomes and design activities so they can learn. Okay, and so. And we talked about this for some time. And we finally realized that this, we have a paradigm now for how we see student engagement. And really, for students to engage, there's three elements that must be designed into your course. And this is, by the way, not Canvas helps you with this, helps you deliver, and does a very good job helping you. But what Canvas cannot do is do it for you. No platform can do it for you. One is organizing the learning activities and figuring out what outcomes you need. And that is a, provide a framework that in the time frame given, and this is always going to be more flexible than a face-to-face -face course. So students know what they need to do and then access it and engage in the material. You have to kind of guide the horse through. And this comes back to what um, earlier this Wednesday, I believe um, Ahmed Luck, Luckleb, Luckab gave a talk on user interface design. And he was very clear on this. He said 
that you have to basically provide them a good default path, an easy path that gives them bite-sized steps that get, leads them there. And part of that, the unspoken rule is you have to make it easy. The course material can be challenging, and it is challenging, especially in the STEM world. But in this case, we don't want to make the navigation hard. The goal is to make it easy to access hard material. Okay, and with that, that organization then leads to planning for student interaction with material. So that could be what reading the textbook, that could be um, videos, that, and we use both those very heavily. Although we'll talk about other things, you have to find ways to engage them with the material by various types of assignments, and you have to find ways to engage them with other students. All right, and then the instructor is there to guide the interactions. So obviously, as Nina already mentioned, we're making sure they don't get lost in the stream. Um, and the other thing is, if you have student-student interaction, make sure that they're moderated, and provide feedback to students. And if there's a, and inevitably, none of the elements are perfect. If problems occur, it is the instructor presence is critical in realizing that something's gone wrong and fix it. Remember, you can't count on a student to come to you and say, this is broken. You can't count on that. So you have to be very careful with that. So, and the key to Canvas, what makes Canvas work very well for this, is this integration of tools. So part of it is we, can, we don't have to use just Canvas. Both of us, in fact, use external tools, particularly for homework, because in, in the STEM context, it is, um, no generic learning management system is going to be able to provide the detailed sort of feedback, particularly in chemistry where we have drawings, okay? But what Canvas does a very good job of is, is allowing you to integrate different course elements to provide basically a default path and provide different, make it easy for students to navigate whatever path they go in. If you follow a few simple rules, I, and basically what we do, is we treat the modules tool as the center of our course. And we've, I think this, almost every instructor does this. And so, if you look at this, and we, the point is then, if I use, even though the modules are simple, I link everything back to modules. And also what we've done, and actually what, I'll say this, even though we, she teaches in mathematics, and we're going to showcase some of the examples of mathematics. I'm going to showcase my elementary chemistry class. And I will say this, both our, both our designs, when we came back to it, both of us pretty much came out to be fairly similar. Some details are different, but they're not critical. Um, so, but you can navigate via calendar to figure out what you need to do and then get to the module page. Okay, you can go, you have your quizzes linked to from there. Assignments are linked to from there, and obviously, of course, content isn't there. But we do not hide any of the other elements. Okay, so without further ado, I'm going to first show you um, one of my courses, which is going to be, which is my elementary chemistry one. This is a chemistry, one semester chemistry course. This is actually a six week course for um, allied health students, so a fair number of nursing students a fair number of um, allied health. So we're talking about, say, people going into dental hygiene may wish to take this course. And especially in the summer, you get a lot more um, visiting students. So people are not normally on this campus. So we, the key is the front page, there's a quick overview of what the course is. Um, and also the key is that we, link them directly to the modules. So we basically point them, look, go to the modules tool. Okay. And each week, this is on student view. And the top, I've tended to provide some general course information, mostly because, just so that they have quick access to syllabus and so on. And, but, and then actually, if you go down, I probably should move this at some point, but um, but you go down, there's a weekly module. So each week, students know what they need to do, except for the first week when I've got an introduction. 
but I make it fairly clear, and I don't think students have had problems with this, to get through there. And there's a dead, the deadline is specified. So students know what they're expected to do each week. And each deadline is set up as a separate assignment. So even though my discussions have a response component, what I do over here, okay, is that I have a category. In fact, I separate, let me see. I really need to show by type. That's a lot easier in here. So over here, I have the initial posts being the forums themselves. But then the responses are, in fact, a separate assignment. What that means is in calendar, two things. One, they have a separate rubric for the response, and they know what they're responsible for. Number two, more importantly, is in calendar, they can then, if you look at the calendar over here, Okay, you can see that the response shows up as a separate assignment. So if they're checking off their assignment list, they can check it off themselves. Now, none of this is perfect, but this is what we, this is where we got to so far. And then in each, and then what we do with forms is use rubrics for responses. Now, the I use page, we all use pages to develop, although we've, in, as Nino explains a bit later, we will explain how we at IU may you do things somewhat differently. But I'm going to show you one of my um, module pages. So we keep, I keep elements reasonably small, reasonably. So typically, each homework assignment, which is about half a chapter or third of a chapter, maps to one of these pages. And you can see that we well, have modules you always provide a link to return to modules, no matter where you are. So students are lost, they go back to modules. And then I outline what they need to do. And the assignments are different. So here I have, um, so they have to read. I give them, I tell them what they have to re read up on. So they have a list of elements to learn here. I may, and I'll provide videos. Some of these are pulled from the internet. And I, but the bad thing about pulling from the internet is that you don't, your presence is not there. And also, quite often, there are little niggles where the way you want to communicate it is different than how the internet does. So what, um, and we've talked about this a lot, I think, between us. And I think what we came up with is this. It's the difference between dragging in a guest lecturer and you teaching a class, if you use a face-to-face -face analogy to it. So, for example, I can't, I'm not Tom Lehrer. I can't sing the Element song or play the piano that well. So, I'm not going to sing the Element song and play the piano. And so he's gonna have to do it. Um, and then, but here, for other content where it is appropriate, I record my own videos because it's not gonna make it, if it makes not, doesn't make a difference. Even though there's videos, tons of videos out there, but it provides your presence. It shows that you or someone from your institution is there, okay? And I use some figures as well over here and I explain, I provide context on this page as to what I'm looking for, okay? And then the other thing I have done here is that I have also assigned students, quite often, students are assigned activity so in my course and this varies from course to course there's two types of activities one is in terms of things that you have to submit through the science tool one is going to be worksheets so the why we have worksheets i talked about using online homework earlier we do use online homework so um in uh, pre-calculus which she'll show later it is we use um, web assign but and in chemistry we've been using sapling and one thing, but why do we want to show up? Well, we want to actually provide feedback and we want to understand how they're thinking about the problem. Getting the answer right is only half a battle. So I do want to see some of that. And for that reason, we do have show work. And they, well, what we tell the students to do is use their cell phone, take pictures, put in a Word document and upload it into the um, assignment tool. Okay. And I think the new doc viewer is gonna help with that, because it means that if they turn a JPEG, if I understand reading correctly, we can comment on it. 
Now, but the other type of activity I've used here is this is a simulation. So this is a simulated experiment. And so students are expected to work with this embedded simulation. And so they can visualize what they're doing and model what's going on, hopefully better than otherwise. And then they have an, a worksheet that they have to complete based on that. Okay. Remember, if you don't, if you consider it important, you have to grade it. At least that's our experience, at least dealing with such a diverse student body. And then, so all assignments are related. So they are told what to do, bit by bit. I'm probably a bit on the busy side. Some people are less busy on this, but that's what it, we've done so far. And finally, we do use quizzes to provide instant feedback on, on testing. And also because in an online course, you can't do without. And what I've actually done is built huge test banks behind it. Enough test banks that you will get a similar quiz each time, but not enough that you would a second attempt is going to hurt you. So in fact, and that's how it's handled. The other thing we do is discussions, as I mentioned already. So students have to post the discussion thread and then come back. So I think this is where I hand go back. And let's see. to remember here is we're trying to get rid of this whole dynamic where a student comes into the course and all they see is a list of here's your assignment, here's your due date, collect points, pass go and collect $200 today, kind of right? So we're trying to avoid just that stale environment. So what you were seeing in UK's chemistry class is a lot of just dynamic. There's animations, there's videos, whether that be something he created or he has the best lecture as he said, coming in through like a YouTube video or something like that. Um, to get the students to actually engage with the content and the material, that's one of the problems we faced early on in our online classes was the students would not engage in that lecture portion in an online class and just try to dive straight into the homework. And then you could imagine the disastrous effects if they didn't understand anything that was being presented because they hadn't engaged with the material in the class. That is that they even looked at it. Right, exactly. And you, when we could see that there weren't even page views and some of that. So we were looking at, okay, what can we do to make this environment more interactive? What can we do to, um, you know, trigger that, that visual learning to draw them into those pages? And we have found that those animations that are embedded in the page videos embedded in the page they were doing a lot to get the students engaged with the content engaged with the material much more than if they came into a page and they saw something that looked like this right here um so dynamic pages uh it was a big deal um and then to, of course discussions with their classmates that was helpful too we also found that the more, at least I know this is definitely true in, in the math side, is the more elements we were putting into the, the course, the more critical it was that we tell the students very clearly and over and over again, if you start to feel lost, remember the hub, the core starting point is your modules tab. If any time you're starting to feel that, just go back to that modules tab and that will give you that extra little little bit that you might need. Um, all right, so then the, the other thing that we find is something, some mechanism for the student to not only feel engaged, but to feel like they have quick, instant feedback. So as they're reviewing that content, are they getting that feedback? So we, we've made this watering trough of information hopefully appealing, we try to bring them to that, but then they need feedback in order to really feel like either they're getting it or not getting it, they've got to have that, that good feedback. And that just rolls right back to the instructor presence. Um, the, the way the student feels that instructor presence is in getting that feedback. So what, what we saw here on the screen a second ago was two options that I've used successfully with the math side. Um, one is Quizlet. So that's something that can be added into pages. So it's common for me on my quiz um, pages, I'll put a 
some hints and tips about quizzes and you he's bringing that up for us um it's on my quiz pages yeah he'll get the student view on the quiz pages i talk about what the quizzes will look like for the student um there's some things to expect because i don't want it to be a surprise for them um so let me go into some of the the current things that they might have here we go quiz one information let's see if i have it with the quiz one i think in quiz one i just tell them about it and and their information um but what i'll do yeah if i leave student view then you'll be able to see it here we go this is good all right so if i go on down here and go to my quiz information um, then you'll notice these little things embedded right here on screen for the student and it's up to the student to click on them and I, and I let them know and talking to them that these quizlets are they're like flashcards it gives the student the autonomy to choose what kind of review is best for them like do they just want to see both sides of these flashcards and it's just concept review is all that is because that's often the part we miss in the math side is that concept review and then being able to to see what that looks like but if you were to open these and, and you guys can explore that um as you're working with canvas on what those would look like but it's right there it's on screen and then they can start doing review and opening those up those flashcard effect then give them that quick feedback so whether you're using Quizlet or something else point is it's interactive and it's giving them that feedback the other thing um, that we are starting to work with and this would be specific to the IU system I think so if you're not currently with IU and you're just you're a canvas user from another institution um, then you would want to see if there's something similar to what's called quick check bottom line is it's it will put something right there on screen so let me just open one of my weekly um, lessons where I just talk about the lesson so very similar to what you saw in UK's class it's telling them what are the objectives here's some videos for you um, some notes but then down at the bottom, this is that quick check piece. So they've engaged with all that material. Now we wanna know, how are you doing? The student wants to know, how am I doing? So then right here on screen, they can get some feedback and I'm not trying to answer these correct or incorrect here, I'm just clicking on something. But notice it gives a place where this is feedback in the way I would naturally give feedback to a student. Um, they can do these quick checks as many times as they want to. And again, I'm just randomly typing some numbers so that you can see the feedback feature of that. Um, so they can do these and get the feedback that they need. And if they're missing them, the idea is go back, watch those videos, engage with that content material again, and then retry the quick check. So there are points attached to it. And you can have alluded to that. If you're going to put it in there and you want them to do it, there's got to be points. So the points are there, but then we also get that field of instructor present because those feedback pieces that they're getting as they try these questions is very specific in the way I would naturally leave feedback for them. So the students pick up almost immediately that this is feedback I've put in. It's not canned feedback for them. So it's very conversational um, for them. Uh, used to students even though I tried to make it dynamic I tried to have videos and things in there for them um, lots of links for them they were bypassing the page but as soon as I put in that quick check that that's letting them at their time see how they're doing and giving them feedback it increased instructor presence it increased their interaction with content um, it's made major improvements to the quality of work yeah. that they're I mean, providing. I'll say this. I'll say this. I was um, so I, um and this was before um before Quick Check came out. I was uh, there was a point when I was actually piloting Zaption, which is unfortunate I've got, where questions were being embedded into the video. Right. And before that, I would see all these forum discussions, and one of the things they would say, "I don't understand this." Oh, hey, watch this random video. And then, actually, one of my end of term evaluations was, "Hey, if I'm going to do that much work, at least record a lecture for me to watch." Yeah, I mean, it, 
it really is important to get those the students to engage with that content. Um, the more we can do that, the better impact we're going to have just on student success in these STEM classes. Um, and we bypass a lot of different agents. So um, in, in finding an interactive tool, like I said, if you don't have a quick check, um, just find something else that's very similar to that um, so that you can really draw in that interaction and instructor presence. Interaction, whether it be with the instructor or whether it be student to student, have those in there. Um, but it has to be done very intentionally with the course organization because the more interactive you make it, the more likely a link is going to break. And if a link breaks somewhere, students get very frustrated very fast. So as we organize our courses, I think UK and I both have felt like it's very important that we're intentional in our course organization to draw in things that allow it to be interactive on as many pages as possible in that course, and then as much as possible, draw in that instructor presence, whether it be in the rubrics that he was talking about, or the quick feedback on a quiz, or on a quick check pieces help build that up, and ultimately um, increase student success in the courses. So people. So I would like to thank IU East, the Center for Teaching and Learning, for guiding us on a lot of course design issues. Um, both, um, Helping us students. as we try <laughs> to um, learn these new technologies to make our courses more interactive. Yeah, they've yeah. been super instrumental. Um, our colleagues in the School of National Science and Mathematics mm -hmm. for helping us refine our ideas. And also um, from I. Uh, Maggie Ricky, who's been our liaison with the um, Quick Check team. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And thank you both uh, for being here. Um, at this time, we uh, are open to receiving questions in the chat. So if you do have um, a question for our presenters, feel free to post it there. Um, UK and Nina, thank you so much for being here on a Friday afternoon. It's always great to have you. And um, let's see, it doesn't look like there are any questions coming in. However, if you do have any follow-up questions, please feel free to post them in the event page and we'll make sure the presenters um, are able to follow up with you as well. Thank you. Okay. Yep, you're welcome. And have a wonderful weekend, everybody. And we'll see you hopefully in a future session of Canvas Live.